Welcome, everybody. This is the FSH Society's Fundraising 101 webinar series, and our first um, guest speaker for this year is Natalie Moss, who is the General Manager of FSHD Global, uh, which is a foundation dedicated to advocacy and fundraising for FSHD based in Australia. Well, thank you, June, for inviting me to share a bit of knowledge about fundraising. My whole journey throughout life has come from a corporate events background. However, as I was creating I get conferences from an international scale to domestic scale, working with celebrities, working with sporting greats, through to all different facilities of life in the event space, I personally always had a passion for philanthropy. So my spin on fundraising is very top heavy towards identifying who the donor is, the donor mentality. I've created within our institution, being SSHD Global Research Foundation, we have something that we call the five ways to give. And I'll explain to you again that mentality of where does fundraising dollars come from. The rules and tips that I've learned I'll share with you, and really that does come down to the principle that every event, every fundraising opportunity needs an experience during and after the activity. And really, again, identifying what does the definition of fundraising mean? What is identified as the dollar, the value, the emotive behind fundraising? So in my own way, uh, welcome to my little Fundraising 101. I hope it is helpful for each and every one of you who is, is interested and has an aim or a goal in target for this year. So I guess this is the gentle art of teaching, the joy of giving. Um, so next slide. Thank you, June. As I mentioned, it really does begin at the donor journey. Uh, Mr. Smith had a great quote which I really liked where it says, donors don't give to institutions. They invest in ideas and people in whom they believe. So the donor needs to have a belief that their effort or their financial dollar goes somewhere. So you really do need to start with who is the donor? What is their journey? Are they personally connected to my cause? If that is the case, then they will already be keen to participate. If not, then that's not a problem. We just need to understand why are they participating. So what is in it for them? Are they a corporate? Are they going to get networking benefits out of participating in your fun run or attending your gala ball dinner? What is in it for them? Is it a peer pressure or a relationship that brings them into your fundraising circle? Or where do they sit in the five ways of giving? So I'll, um, Zoom, if we could go to the next slide, I'll explain that a little bit clearer. Five ways of giving. Again, it's, 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 what do we live for? If it is not to make life less difficult for each other. I find that quite a powerful quote because the five ways to give is a model which enables everyone to give. Charity is a really unique, uh, I guess, platform in the market. A lot of people are skeptical where the money goes. A lot of people may not be emotionally connected to a charity. For example, cancer councils have a lot of participation because it's quite common for you and your six degrees of separation to, to be linked in some way to cancer. But when you talk about something like an SSHD or a rare disease, it's very difficult, in, in quotation marks, to fundraise because you don't get that mass market who do instantly connect with you. But that's okay. So what the headspace in my fundraising, every activity that I touch, I always go back to this model. Who can help me and how can they help me? At the top we have pockets. So that is a financial donation. Again, it is a wonderful thing to have a financial dollar that comes through and goes out into research in our case. Not everyone can donate a dollar and that is, I guess, one of our key focal points, but it's really important to understand it's not the most important focal point or 100% of the game here. I've defined this as, as, a, as five different ways. So the pocket, the heart, the brain, hands, and network. So when I talk about the heart, there are so many people who are instantaneously connected and passionate. You might have a parent of a sufferer of a rare disease, and they might not have the money to spend in a donation because they have medical costs. But they have passion. They are little life. 
And if you get anyone with passion and a skill, you will get a reward or tick off one of your checklist points in your fundraising from people who have heart, who can contribute in that way. If you have someone who has a brain, a lot of the time I go to meetings and I talk to sponsors and top tier corporates, and yes, they can donate, but what I want out of them is an idea. I want a creative idea. I want an ability for someone to say, I've got um, you know, an idea of a fundraiser. This is what you should be doing. That is such a valuable donation in my way of looking at it because an idea can turn into a dollar. As I said, it doesn't always start and end with a dollar. These are all factors which as you start to build your event and your concept to really consider and look outside the square. Hands is so important for tangible events. That is all about your volunteers and they can honestly make or break an event. It depends who they are, how interested they are, again are they connected to you, again are they there because their boss told them they have to be there. But regardless, you need that heavy weight done. So again, they may not be donating a dollar, but they are adding so much value to your project as a whole. And the last headspace when I look at who is giving to my event, how do I build my event, is network. When I sit down in a meeting, I almost have this phrase that it's a bit of a Tupperware party. I don't want to leave that connection until they've linked me in with a network. It is so important if someone cannot financially donate, if you are riding a bike from one location to another and you send it out to your network and they cannot financially give, just think how else can they give or how else can they contribute to my goal which is fundraising. Thank you, Drew. What I've tried to do to bring events and fundraising back to basics is just simply identifying what fundraising is. You have tangible events and you have electronic fundraising events, if you had to simplify it in that. And between the two categories, there is a big difference in the time management required, the costs required to create these fundraising initiatives, and the relationships that surround you. So if you don't know where to start, but all you know is that you have a goal, you want to raise some money for a particular event, think through what are you going to do. Are you going to create something tangible like a gala dinner, or are you going to create an electronic campaign which doesn't require the hands, the volunteers as such. It wouldn't have the same production costs as per se an annual gala dinner would with the venue, the food and whatnot. And, and as I mentioned, the relationships differ. So with a tangible event, you have to create the time and resources towards ticket sales. You need to support the corporate sponsorship. That's a whole different avenue of time management and relationship building. That is a requirement more like with, that requires a face-to-face -face contact with your relationships. Uh, tangible events can often lead to a very profitable event for a cause. They're in essence larger than life because they take quite a while to build. And I'll give you a few examples of that. Um, one event that we do every year is called our Sydney Chocolate Ball. And it started five years ago with 200 people in the room. This year we hope to have around 700 people in the room. It started as an activity where it raised $250,000 and last year we raised $800,000 on the night and also captured a $1 million donation out of it. So that was a tangible event which took nine months to build. Whereas an electronic event uh, would be as easy as creating a campaign, an everyday hero website where you say to your community, this is my goal or this is my challenge, please support me and all your funds go to a charity of my choice. Again, they're completely different scales and completely different effort requirements but are both that type of fundraising. So I would really encourage you to sit down as your first step and figure out which direction you're going to go. But whatever direction you go, fund needs to be accountable and it comes back to that circular journey of who are my donors, what is the mentality and, and where does the dollar start and where does it go. Thank you. 
So the first, I guess, lesson which I would share from my teachings over the past few years is that whether it's an intangible event or an electronic event, it's all about the experience. The only thing that matters at Dam is the donor experience. I think that's a fantastic quote by Mark Phillips because it's true. You have so many gala dinners and so many charities in this world that are worthwhile causes. How do you get Red Smith to attend your gala dinner? How do you set yourself apart? The Sydney Chocolate Ball, as an example to that case study, set itself apart because we built a gala dinner on the theme of chocolate. We linked it to our cause. Our cause is muscular dystrophy. And we had this, I guess, topical link where chocolate is high in antioxidants, antioxidants are good for muscles. So we were able to create an experience of the chocolate ball. What that meant was everything had to be chocolate. We wanted people to walk into the room and say, Wow, there's a chocolate catwalk and there's chocolate fountains and chocolate inspired menu. So we got the best chef in Australia to create a chocolate inspired menu. It was chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. We went to Lynx. We got the sponsors on board. But it all started from an idea where the first bullet point to think about was what is the experience? And people left that event remembering how they felt. So it was an experience at the event and an experience memory post event. So I really encourage you to keep that in the top of your mind with whatever fundraising you're, uh, you're doing. Thank you. It's so important to take the donor on that journey. And this is, this is the Ice Bucket Challenge, which is a great case study, again, for a fundraising event that was an electronic fundraising concept. So last year, this became a new social media craze. It didn't have the cost of a chocolate ball. It didn't have the effort of a chocolate ball. But it had an incredible result. And why? Because it tapped in to the people who have that giving mentality of the hands and the brains. It was an idea and it went viral with people sharing it. The person who started this, uh, well, one of the people who started this, Corey Griffin, he actually started it without donating a dollar. He was affected with the, um, the ASL which is the, um, I can never pronounce this, but it's a mini trophic lateral sclerosis, which is a neurogenetic disorder. And he basically gripped with his friends, and his friends said, we're going to do something for you. We're going we're gonna to create a campaign, a wacky campaign. And they threw a bucket of cold ice over their head, and they, they sent it out. And what they did was it was the multiplier effect, because it had, it had a challenge in it. One person challenged three people. And through that, they started to make donations and donations. So this, the ALS Association received $7.6 million between July 29 and August 1st last year, which was $6.2 million up from the same period the year before, which is an incredible, incredible example of how efficient electronic fundraising can be. It is the power of the social media and relationships in this situation which spread it viral. You had celebrities uh, like Justin Timberlake, you had, you had Lady Gaga, Jennifer Lopez, Bill Gates, you had billionaires, you had people in all different forms of politics, all different walks of life. Uh, even President Obama got involved and it, was, it became a fun thing to do. It had that, that ability to uh, roll on and um, it grew not only fundraising but awareness, which is also a really nice thing to kick off with your fundraising. So it ticked the box of experience, it went through the donor model with who can help me here, and in essence it started with, with an, I guess, someone who wanted to change the world in their own way, that multiplier effect. So it can work both ways, tangible or electronic events, the powerful, powerful tool which is in the sitting corner at correct. Thank you, Jude. Moving away from that experience and that creativity behind the success of an event is the important lesson of identifying that fundraising is an investment. It's a very big call nowadays to simply say, I'm a charity. I deserve your donation. Or 
I'm hosting a charity gala dinner, I'm hosting a gala dinner on behalf of the charity, we deserve a holiday to auction. Give us, give us, give us. What we've been very successful in building our fundraising events is the relationship behind understanding that fundraising is an investment. It's, it's an investment from a sponsor of their time, their commitment and their dollars. So people want to have that connection when they agree to fundraise with you. Next slide please, Drew. So understanding the value of the dollar, it is so important. As I mentioned, establishing a fundraising event is an investment of your time. So there needs to be an element of your time effort ratio to how much you target in funding. It's great to have goals, but you want to keep them somewhat realistic as well. But apart from your investment, there's also an investment from the financial dollar. So as you can see at the top, a dollar needs to have a complete circle. It needs to have an experience from the person giving it, so they're happy to give it. They'll come back next year and re-give it because they experienced something which they personally could connect to. And it needs to be accountable. You need to share with that donor the full story, where that money's gone. I.e., I've rode a bike from you know, place A to place B, and your money will help me do that and we're raising funds for kids with cancer or FSHD. The person's going to give you the money if they can either join you in the ride, meet you at the end and shake your hand, or feel that satisfaction that their money went to a good cause or at least went to watching you sweat as you ride your bike. So it needs to be a full circle when you're talking to people who will be assisting you with your fundraising. I think a lot of time people just, as I said, put their hands out and expect it. And those days are gone with fundraising. There's so many incredible causes out there and people are careful with where they put their fundraising dollars and they want to participate, especially with all these electronic campaigns and technology at our fingertips. The whole mentality is moving forward and developing. So if you can try to build these building blocks around as mental little checkpoint lists, I think you'll find you'll have a bit of a fuller understanding of how to build an event. Next slide, please. It brings me to accountability and transparency. One thing that we were successful in as a foundation is our structure. From day one, we allocated the first tax deductible dollar that came into research straight out to research. And we continue that model to this day. Uh, all of our overheads and costs are covered with non-tax deductible support to the foundation. So we really split it. So as a foundation, we're able to say 100% of your tax deductible donation or your pledge goes straight immediate into medical research. So what we did as a tool to show you how important accountability is as a buzzword in this space, um, if you could go to the next slide, please, Jean. What we did as an organization was we built an app. And this was an app to simply express what we do internally to the world. So we built a very simple app which has four little areas, a chairman's message, our achievements. So we have a few, uh, I guess, our top achievements for the year which shows, again, our development and where that funds go and how our growth is. We put part of our research identifying all the grants and where that donation dollar goes. But the, the key to the app was we created something called My Donations. And it's a tool where you can see that it identifies you as an individual under a private ID number, the date you donated, the amount you donated, and exactly where that money has gone, so which grant that's gone to. So in this example, on the 9th of the 8th, 2010, someone donated $20 and it went to Grant 15. And then that user can look at Grant 15 and see where their money literally physically went and has the update of that scientific grant. So this was a tool which helped build the donor journey. It helped identify to corporates and all of my sponsors that I get every year from my physical, tangible events just how transparent we are. And it also shows the donors and the sufferers our drive to finding that cure. So this was a tool as such 
which, which was able to identify uh, the importance of being transparent in the charity space. Next slide, please, Drew. And as I mentioned, this tool then resulted in a $1 million donation to our charity. So this gentleman, Bob he is a very um, he's a self-made entrepreneur. He has a number of different businesses that he runs successfully. He attended our gala dinner as a guest. He listened to a story of an SSHD sufferer who was emotionally connected. He then discovered our app and thought, wow, wow, I can actually track my dollar. I can see that a dollar goes to the cause. And, and that was the selling point for him in the fundraising. So we wouldn't have had him connect if the app wasn't built and we wouldn't have built the app if we didn't understand the donor journey and what they want to receive out of it. So fundraising is your catalyst. Events and fundraising are your catalyst for, for the end result. And part of that end result you need to, as I keep saying, bring people on that journey, give them the experience, uh, and identify where possible that accountability and tangibility. And this is a great example of, of how we did it last year. Next slide, please, Jude. So these are a few pictures of our chocolate ball. And as another case study in comparison to the Ice Bucket Challenge, this goes back to a tangible event where we have to sell ticket sales, where you require corporate sponsorship, where there are relationships built uh, a built leading into the event, after the event. We really do invest in the experience. We try to balance our costs successfully with as much sponsorship as possible. So this is your top tier fundraising. Um, this is more your little group of committee of where all your ideas come in and this is an example of the results. Whereas as I keep mentioning your electronic might be an individual wanting to achieve something. Uh, what I've put together is a little video which is a, a snapshot of the chocolate ball which we'll play in a moment. But as you can see, part of these events, what we did was we went to the best of the best brands here in Australia. We went to Moa Tennessee in Australia and they came on board as a, as a corporate partner and we've been able to turn this event into the only charity event in this country that Moet Hennessy provide their top tier champagne to. So we are able to offer our sponsors bottles of Krug and Dom Perignon and Moet Chandon and all of these beautiful, beautiful champagne experiences. But we're a charity. We can't afford it. That's a sponsorship. So these tangible events rely so much on sponsorship in order to cover those costs. And I've seen so many people host an event they don't get the sponsorship, their costs outweigh the benefit at the end of the day and they raise next to nothing and they put nine months of effort into it. So that's why I say to you at the very beginning, identify your time management, identify your production costs for this type of event and think through your relationships because you want to kick start an event like this scale already knowing that you've sold 20% of the room. An example of this event, as I mentioned, it started off with an idea saying, well, we really don't want to have to have the face of the humeral dystrophy, you know, annual gala dinner ball, 2015. That's not really a, an appealing or, or sexy title, so we turned it into a chocolate ball. We found the link between the cause and the scene. We built our chocolate menu, as I mentioned. Uh, another element to really heighten that experience was I created something called the Australian Chocolate Couture Award. And for me, having that event experience, everything needed to be chocolate. It was, <laughs> it was quite a fun project. So I don't have a budget. I want entertainment. I can't afford it. And I want chocolate entertainment, which doesn't exist even if you go on all these entertainment agencies. So I thought outside the square and I went to the leading colleges of design, Sergi University students, and I challenged those colleges to create chocolate garments. I went in and I had a competition all around the country where I then selected the 10 finalists from the top 
colleges where they had ideas of how they could create a garment made by chocolate wrappers, chocolate body paint, anything that looked or touched or was inspired by chocolate. And I was thinking, that's good enough. Uh, but why would they donate their time, purchase all the materials in their own pocket for a charity, then I don't have a budget. So what I then created was a reason. Again, going into that mentality of why, what can they give, how can they give, and why would they give? So I created a panel of iconic Australian judges, which came from fashion designers. Uh, it went into styling, professional stylists of, of fashion magazines. I had a editorial, ed editorial head of Vogue and a few Australian fashion media outlets sit on the panel. I've had social media fashion, fashion bloggers, a number of different areas of fashion which were the selling tool for my model. I got the model sponsored, the hair sponsored, and all of a sudden there was an event within an event which created an experience for the audience to watch. And the winner of the catwalk, it was a live competition, the winner of the catwalk would receive a mentoring experience by all judges. So that was an exercise that I built year one, and now it has turned into curricula for Australian colleges. I have more and more judges wanting to donate more than just about one hour or one day of their time into a full program. So it's, it's, with these events, they get scale and they grow and they grow and they grow. But when you start your first one, I encourage you to be as creative as you can Understand the experience and take it through as many different dimensions as you can. And again, be very smart with your sponsorships and try to paint them into your picture. We're very fortunate now as a foundation, which is Chocolate Ball, we can always select and choose which sponsors we want to continue growing this with, as opposed to having to accept a sponsor because we need um, to cover the cost. We have, um, and that's also created a great diversity in the room. So. That was a case study of a tangible event that's been growing and growing. So perhaps, June, you wanted to show a quick little 10-second video of, of the chocolate ball last year. The thing we also do each year is slightly female chocolate ball. So this was the 2013 chocolate ball, which was chocolate, but it was a Chinese chocolate ball. Can you hear it? Yeah. Again, just how creative this event is, we have an internal ballroom where entertainment is. And as I mentioned, that was a Chinese inspired, so we had a lot of Chinese um, quirky little things happening. Then we also have a pre-event space, and we have its own entertainment in the pre-event space, so people can constantly walk between the first part and the second part all night, and there's active shows happening. Then we have a third party, which is our after party, which is full of entertainment in its own right. It's not just a bar to go to. So this whole chocolate ball is pushing the boundaries of that creativity and leaving that memory behind. And each little section opens up into either it's compartmentized or flowing throughout. So that's, I guess, a scale of an, uh, taking a standard charity event 
as such into pushing the limits with that headspace of what is experience, what is experience. Because you can't forget that people will forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that was a quote once by Maya Angelou, and, and I just really remember that because it's so true. So true. Next slide, please, June. So hopefully this picture is being painted with how we get to fundraising. I think the last key to it is definitely relationships and sponsors, how to work with them, because they are really the key to your fundraising. Uh, you know, another, another great quote, there, there are two I's in fundraising. They should stand for inspiration and innovation, not imitation and irritation. And again, Events have a cookie-cutter model to them. Yes, you can ride a bike from point A to point B, but let's not imitate... Uh, in Australia, we have the Cancer Council as a charity. They own that experience in many ways. Every year they have their big ride, and if a little charity tries to replicate it, um, everyone would assume they're raising money for cancer but, because they, they own that space. So in many ways, if we were to ride here in Australia, a bicycle from point A to point B, we need to spin it. We need to create a different experience so that fundraising initiative stands out in the mind separate to what the Cancer Council are doing. Uh, so we try really, really hard to continue that inspiration and that innovation. Our app was, was I guess, a result from our innovative thoughts in how do we get more fundraising dollars, um, again, through the relationships of that accountability element when thinking fundraising. Um, next step, please, June. When it comes to relationships, I guess there are three key elements that come to my mind. Relationships need to be beneficial full stop. Whether it's a corporate sense or a not-for-profit sense, they need to be two-dimensional. So when I go and sit down and talk to someone about sponsoring a chocolate ball or perhaps pushing through an EDM, uh, it needs to, I need to go into that discussion aware with what my sponsor will take out of it, what's in it for them. A relationship, obviously, as an example, um, all these logos of people who, only half of my sponsors at my chocolate ball, What's in it for them? So if I look at Dom Perignon, what's in it for them? Dom Perignon gives me complimentary champagne because my event in Sydney is a top tier event. I get the who's who of Sydney going to it. And realistically, that is the ideal market for Dom Perignon. For Dom Perignon, the relationship there is it's multi beneficial. And I would allow Dom Perignon to speak to my network. It needs to work both ways is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with, with most of those organizations, there's a thought through relationships. And we more or less, uh, obviously a foundation gives us financial support uh, and, and donation through time or volunteers, but there, there needs to be that thought of what can we give them. Lead generation comes to mind. I can then connect Don Perion to one of my top sponsors or donors and hopefully Don Perion can create a personal relationship with them. Or I can connect my audio-visual company, which sponsors all of my lights and all of my staging, to a Macquarie Bank in the hopes that they can talk to Macquarie Bank about building their stages for their conferences. So the way that I look at the charity network is what's in it for them? What's in it for the foundation? What do we want out of the relationship? How can we manage that relationship and how can we actually grow into that networking way of thinking with connecting the dots and all of the relationships around? As I mentioned before, it really is that Tupperware mentality. You go into a meeting wanting to walk away with at least one lead that you can follow up which will assist your fundraising. So whether you're riding that bike or you're selling a ticket to a table, you really want to Spend your time with one person and it leads off in another direction to a second person and a third person. So again, it's that viral fundraising which the Ice Bucket Challenge did so successfully. So it really is constantly connecting the dots all around you, whether it's corporate or an individual, it's connecting those dots. So again, another great quote that I like, 
Profit in business comes from repeat customers, customers that boast about your project or service, and that brings friends with them. So those relationships with my chocolate ball, it, it works. Don Perignon and Moet Hennessy have participated since day one, and there's a benefit in both, and there's an honest, true relationship and friendship there. So the more fundraising you do, the more your relationships and connections grow. It's an organic thing. Uh, if you were to be that sole person riding that bike example, you already start with all of your friends and your relationships. When you're doing your tangible event, it's almost the reverse. You have to build your friends and relationships in the corporate space. So they're just a top way down and bottom way up looking at fundraising in both of those examples. Thank you, Jude. So as I was mentioning, in, in I guess a bit of an overview and caption shot for you, it's really important to understand that structure. What is your personal investment in that project? What is your target? Is it realistic? Uh, you will find out once you sit to and figure, literally write your contacts who you are going to go and talk with or who you're going to email your um, sponsorship, you know, support me writing my bicycle activity to. Understand your time management in it. Is my fundraising project that I want to achieve tangible or electronic? Am I going to do it on my own? Do I need a little committee of friends or people around me? What can I lean on for that support? Obviously, the more time and resources you put into it, the bigger result you may have, perhaps. But then again, I suck a challenge one group of friends and they ended up with you know, a $6 million increase. doesn't always happen. The mentality Capture that mentality in your own mind. Try to think it's not only about the dollar. Fundraising, you always think money. Fundraising is awareness. Fundraising is networking. Fundraising is an opportunity to get in front of a corporate. Fundraising is a dollar because it goes into your cause. But get out of that paradigm. Think of that five methods of fundraising model. Create an experience for your sponsors and your donors. Again, what is in it for them with the chocolate ball, an individual who is a guest of a corporate or a relative of someone with a sufferer. They're there for a different purpose than a corporate wanting to network. Try and understand who's who in the room and work to that advantage. Connect someone or, or have a conversation with someone and, and really create the experience of what they what you expect they want out of it. Try and deliver it to them. Be very conscious of that. I guess to, as I mentioned, be accountable for your fundraising and share the whole story. Connect that dollar experience accountability cycle where you can say, I'm proudly riding from city to city. It's going to take me 48 hours. Uh, will you sponsor me? Your money is going to a cause. And if you are covering your cost, say I'm covering my cost, 100% of your money goes to my cost. If you're not covering your cost, say I'm not covering my cost. You know, you're supporting me, and together we will, you know, participate. Or I'm not covering my cost. Will you help me cover my cost so I can go to someone and get that additional sponsorship? A lot of times you have these models where people uh, need to raise. $4,000 or $5,000 to even participate in these bicycle rides. So there's different models out there. It depends what you want to do and what your relationships and current networks are like. Um, but I just really encourage you when you think about your relationships to try and connect the dots. You'll be so surprised how easy it is when you think of the six degrees of separation, who you know and who someone wants to know that you actually know. If you can connect them, they'd be so grateful and generous back towards you with what you're campaigning for. To me, that is a little bit of, an, of a 101 on fundraising, how it cycles together, because it's not as simple as activity equals dollar. Uh, next slide, please. This is my little way of changing the world, as I mentioned, my whole career space started in events. I've always been personally very philanthropic. Uh, Bill Moss, who established FHC Global, is, is my father. I'm very passionate about this cause. I see it. I live with it. I understand it. I have a unique spin on fundraising from my own corporate background. And in my way, my new role, which is new as of January, 
as stepping in as the managing director of SSHC Global, I really want to assist all of us to try and challenge this traditional sale model of fundraising. Um, I really do believe that we don't work in the not-for-profit sector, we work in the for change sector. So let's change the world, change the world in any way you can. And if you ride that bike and you make $10, $10 is an incredible contribution to, to causes like this. Uh, you can change the world by just volunteering your time, an idea, or a connection, or an activity. So um, I would love to hear more about what your, all your headspaces are and guide you as much as I can to my abilities. And I just hope that that short download of, of information and education that I've picked up over the years is somewhat helpful to what you are all trying to achieve. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish we could applaud over the internet. So there's <laughs> but, um, but I think Doug is back. Yes. Good. So uh, yes, I am. I'd like to yeah, hi. I'd like to open the floor to any questions. So I have one. I noticed that um, over the over email, you have um, the FSHC Global was offering um, some uh, champagne, um, special sales of champagne. So, um, can you talk about that? Seems like an example of this kind of closing the loop. Um, exactly. You know, so, connect. Yeah. Exactly. So, what we do now at Hennessy is our generous, generous supporter of all of our champagne and our chocolate ball. And as I mentioned, they have a very high interest in our top tier donor target market. So part of my negotiations with them in their sponsorship is I give them a table at my chocolate ball, which I would normally sell for $25,000. It doesn't cost me $25,000, but that's what I sell it for. In return of giving them a table, they then give me a value of about $40,000 in champagne, which is a cost that they sponsor. So already on paper, it, it's supported the foundation um, in the sense that I get free product, there's no cost. I've supported a relationship because they can now bring 10 people to an event which they are seen as a high sponsor at. And those 10 people, we always try to encourage them to bring 10 people that would also be a high donor. So they buy raffle tickets, they buy auction items, and again, it helps, it helps the foundation. So that's an example of a multi-beneficial relationship, how we do it. Uh, what I have then started to do is say to them at Hennessy, what else do you want? Because obviously you're in the room, you can see, you can show off to your clients that you're bringing, that you're behind this event, uh, what else can we assist you with? So last year we came up with a concept of sending an EDM out to our database where they would be selling champagne of all different types of champagne for a sale price, an exclusive sale price to SSHD Global members. And in return the foundation clips the ticket and receives a percentage of sales that are made. So again, what does that do? It gives no tenancy exposure to my database of thousands of people. It's something that promotes their business, promotes their website. It's a sale. So from my end, I am offering a discounted price, which is appealing. And people know that if they purchase this champagne through this model, not only do they get a discounted price, but the foundation benefits. So that's a very clear communication that purchase your champagne and drink for charity. So it's a bit of fun in how we market it as well. So that's how we do our relationships. It's all about not just please support products for my event, um, I'm going to sell you a table um, and we're not going to open anything else because we've already got you as a table. It always has to be pushed as far as it can. Great, thanks. Can, can I ask okay. this? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Um, so we saw a little bit about what 
the chocolate ball was like in 2013. Can you tell us what year it started and what that experience was like? Sure. Uh, we actually have a YouTube channel as well called FSHD Global. So there's quite a few, um, I guess, snapshots from the years of the chocolate ball, if you want a visual explanation. But how it started was I hired a banquet hall from one of the hotels here, the Intercontinental, and I had capacity of 250 people. Now, I went to the day... I went to the event in the morning when they were setting up. Not to, 250 seats did not fit in that room. Mm -hmm. So I had to call some people and ask them not to attend, um, which oh. is stressful for the first event. But what had happened was we sold 250 tickets very quickly. It was our first event. We, we publicized it well, and it was not a problem. That event we had, uh, it was called the Sydney Chocolate Ball. We had our chef. We established our Couture Awards. It was full of entertainment. We had companies throwing us auction items. We had corporates happy to participate because it was the first time they had been asked, which you find. Second year round, that's the challenge because traditionally you go back to the same holiday company and say, oh, look, you know, you supported us the year before, can you do it again? And they go, oh, well, we did it last year. We will give it to a different cause this year. No, you can't have it twice. That's the problem with fundraising in, in a number of years in a row. People have a short rope and you cannot really rely on the same support networks. You have to always grow it and develop it. But we were very lucky because, because we created an experience at our first event. Literally the week after, we had people on a, on a wish list of tickets for the next year. We hadn't got a date. We didn't know the cost of the tickets. We had no idea of our capacity. But we converted 30% of that room overnight into the next year ticket sales. Wow. We wow. sold out three months before the event again at a capacity of 480 people. So we doubled our capacity within six months. And we did get the same holidays and we did get the same um, plus more because we started to build relationships with people. If someone would give me a holiday experience that I could sell for $10,000, I would give them two tickets in the room so they could see what they were giving to as opposed to a cold, this is another charity. So I really tried to get people in the flesh to participate. That was a cost for me, but I figured if I can raise... 10000 in an auction and $500 as a cost is okay. And that was a successful model. We still, six years in, have... It's almost an issue now because we have the same charity auction items and very similar people in the room, so we have to refresh it. But these corporates just want to keep coming and giving and giving. Um, so the third year that we had it, we increased it by about 80 people and, again, sold out within three months. And last year we were up towards the 600 figure mark. And again, we sold out. We, could, we actually would keep going if we could have the seats in the room. So in 2015, we're moving to much bigger venues. Every year I take it somewhere that's bigger and bigger and bigger. But this year we're going to a venue that has capacity of 800 people. So to go from 600 to 800 is uh, a lot more sales driven, we need a lot more sponsors, it's a much bigger bigger event. But then again, you have questions, do you want to keep it small and niche or do you want to grow it? Uh, where's the emphasis on how much money you can raise for the cause? But it turns into its own beast. But it came back to successfully giving people an experience and following through with relationships that were beneficial. That's the answer to the success of the chocolate ball. Full stop at that. It actually is that simple. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. It seems to me that the all the best examples that I hear of these charity events are things that happen on an annual basis. Is do you think that's really the only way to have a successful charity event? No, I don't. I think that you see them happen on an annual basis because 
generally as a charity you need one fundraiser which you know will work and it takes you a year to put that together. So you keep the momentum by having that fundraiser as an annual event. So traditionally as a foundation we have the chocolate ball because it works. It raises very good funds for us. SSH Global aims to raise around one and a half million each year which goes straight to research. And that chocolate ball, um, you know, commits eight hundred thousand dollars to that. So it's such a big, I guess, fundraising initiative for us, we would never let it go. But a successful fundraising event can be any time of the year. It can be a one off event, it can be a, an email campaign. It can be anything. It doesn't have to be an annual recurring. Um, I guess the chocolate ball is successful because of the scale and the effort and the size and the capacity that goes into it. Um, as I said, that's why you want to keep it the momentum alive. But I've seen so many fantastic campaigns. Even as a foundation, we've had some really um, good electronic campaigns which have seen fantastic dollars come through to fundraising. It's just the, cre the creativity behind it. More so than the scale, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, on on the experience side for the contributors, though, it I also have heard from you know, a number of my friends that run these kind of annual events that that people really like the idea of sort of there's sort of this this normalcy and this habit that gets established, and they're like, oh yeah, that's coming up and that's coming up, um, and and that seems to be a really nice selling feature of the annual events is it it sort of gets ingrained in people's heads. Um, and I, I just was wondering if that kind of almost makes that sort of a more natural way to do it. I think you get momentum because if you have a corporate that buys a table, the next year you have a reason to call them up and meet them and say, will you buy a table again? There's, there's momentum in that. Um, as a foundation, we have a number of annual events. So we do two golf days a year, we do a gala dinner, and then outside of that we have other campaigns which we recreate each year as well because I think it's important if you're going to have the same golf day or the same gala dinner or the same event on repeat, you really are in a position that you have to reinvent yourself every year. And I think the downfall in, in some cases is people don't put the emphasis of reinvention. They just again expect that same person to buy a table and they expect it goes into you know, the calendar, which is great because in most cases it does, but you almost want to keep impressing and improving these people 